All right. I'm David, and I'm going to talk about how we are running a soft real-time service at one million queries per second using Scylla. Um, first of all, I'm going to take a little bit of time to say what it is that we do at Adgear. Uh, we are in the online advertising business, so ad tech for short. Uh, the way it works is that when you visit a website and there is an ad on it, the ad that you are going to be shown is not decided until after you visit. Um, on the way it happens, it's, uh, it's a real-time auction. Uh, within usually 100 milliseconds, the interested parties have to bid. Say, oh, I'm willing to pay this much, this many dollars for this person. And then we take all bids together and the, the, the highest one wins. But it has to happen fast. Um, in our case, so we do, we do web, we do mobile. Um, we see one million of those bid requests per second. And we have to decide quickly enough whether we want to participate in a given bid. Uh, I gave the figure of 100 milliseconds. That's an estimate. It, it varies a little bit by exchange and etc. On, on how close or far we are from the um, from the exchange. So if we spend 10 milliseconds on the wire communicating with the exchange, that's this much time less we have to reach a decision and decide to to bid. Um, so given that should be obvious that the one measure that's most important for us um, using a database is read latency. Um, let's say that we have, we have to do other computations, not just retrieve user profiles. Uh, we could have maybe from 10 to 50 milliseconds available to wait for a response from a database to retrieve user profiles. Uh, if the response arrives after 70 milliseconds, it's too late. We already lost. Um, so that's, uh, that's our most important constraint. Um, the way our bidding gateway is, is, uh, is designed, it's written, it's written in the Erlang programming language. It's a language that was uh, created originally, I think, for phone exchanges where reliability is important. And the most important feature of that language that we use as, at Adgear probably is the ability to set timeouts. So to start a computation and to say, well, if the result hasn't come in after X milliseconds, throw it away, we don't care anymore. All right. Um, currently, we operate, OK, maybe I should say a little bit more about the company. Uh, Adgear is originally a spin-off of a big Quebec ad agency uh, that started when doing things online became important. Um, and last year or so, we got acquired by Samsung Electronics. Uh, so we're going to, to grow on a much more global scale. But at the originally and still at the moment, um, our big market is North America. So we have one DC on the east coast of the US, one DC on the west coast of the US. They are similarly sized, and we're starting up uh, some presence in Western Europe. Uh, but that's smaller at the, mo at the moment. Um, obviously, given our uh, latency requirements, we, we put the database um, cluster, well, the database nodes, close to our gateway client. We don't want to, you know, for no reason, add uh, network latency. Uh, I went maybe a bit quickly on the previous data, uh, on the Cassandra setup. This has about 30 nodes. And it is serving, as I said, a bit above 1 million read queries per, per second. Um, and we are in the process of transitioning to, to Scylla. The reason we're doing that is that um, sometimes that could be when load is higher or that could be for no reason, the read latency we observe using Cassandra spikes. 
And as I said before, that's no good. If it's too slow, it's as good as, as if we didn't have a database at all. Um, so given that we, we, we felt that we hit a wall with Cassandra, we were not able to, to make it, to tune it, to behave better on, in a more reliable way. Uh, so we tried Scylla, which seemed natural, given that it's supposed to be fully compatible with Cassandra, meaning that the transition, starting a transition would be easy. We could just bloop, put it where Cassandra was and everything, everything would keep working. Uh, so far it's been true, we, we managed to just start switching to Cassandra without rewriting any part of our stack. Uh, it turns out that we're able to serve the same amount of uh, request with about half of the hardware. So this is 13 nodes uh, currently versus 30 for Cassandra. They're not exactly comparable, but it's about half. Mm. Yep. So that's it for the, for the sizing. So, I mean, even if Scylla had no other qualities compared to Cassandra, it would already save us from uh, buying or renting a lot of hardware. Uh, okay, so if you've seen the first talk this morning, you know that averages is not a very good way to, to talk about latency performance. But this, give, this gives a slight idea. So this is not uh, the average latency over a whole day. This is over uh, an hour in our peak time. Uh, so using Scylla, we have a, a clearly lower average latency. Uh, than we had using Cassandra and without, without doing, you know, without doing much tweaking, the, the entire stack on both sides is very compatible. Uh, this perhaps is more interesting. So the, the caption doesn't say, but the upper curve in yellow, it's um, the risk from Cassandra and the other curve uh, below in green is, is Scylla. Uh, it says Marina client. Marina is the, is the Erlang Cassandra client uh, that my colleague Louis Philippe wrote, especially for us. There wasn't one in Erlang, so now there is. Um, it fits in a lot of, uh, uh, with a lot of other libraries so that to, to, to handle, basically mostly to handle queuing and timing out in a, in a nice way. Uh, so on this graph, we can see that the, the, the Scylla latency is lower. So that's nice, we knew that already. And, um, we can sort of see, this is not a crisis on the Cassandra size, but we can see one spike of uh, Cassandra latency. And that's those things that are not too good. We're in the, when we are in the 20 millisecond range, we're okay. But, but if we go to 30 or much higher, then that's, that's bad. And that's, that's typical. It's not a crisis, but it's typical of the performance we, th we see from both databases. I also have a comparison of timeouts because that's perhaps the, the measurement that is closer to, to our needs. So a timeout means uh, we ask to read from database, but it was so slow that we had to discard the results. Um, because of that, we failed to participate in a, in a bid. Uh, this, mean, this means lost business. So that's really bad. We don't, we don't want too many of those. Um, so this is uh, timeouts per second. And the, once again, uh, the, 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 the entire amount of queries that we, of read queries that we send, it's a bit above 1 million per second. So if we compare 150 per second to 1 million, that's a lot. That's like one um, bid request in seven that we are unable to, to respond to. And if we look at the lower curve, which is pretty consistently below 50K per second, 50,000 50, timeouts per, per second, this is much better. This, it means that 95% of the time we are able to, to bid. I mean, or if we're not able, it's not because of the database. So that looks like a very good, uh, very good fit for, for our use case. All right, so far I only mentioned the, uh, the point reads on write, which is definitely the most important to us because it affects the, the business. Um, so the, the, 
the reads are going, are going to be, I see a user in a bid request, I'm going to extract their user profile, and there we're going to do stuff like AI to decide how much to bid. Um, we have also point rise. So let's say you're visiting a website, uh, there might be some code put there, oh well, put there by a client of us that's going to say, well, this user visited that page uh, and they're going to be put in a segment. So if it's a page about buying cars, well, we're going to mark that user as interested in buying a car and that's useful later for targeting an advertising, advertising campaign. The other kind of interaction we have with Cassandra or Sela is, is in bulk, it's not, it's not point rise. Um, and the constraints here are quite different. So for reads, we need the reads to go quickly. For those writes, uh, they're bulk because we got lists of, user, of users to put in a segment. Either we made the computation or we are doing business with companies that are specialized in that they're going to bucket people into segments and send us the, the, the association list. So we might get, perhaps every day we're going to get one million users to put in a bunch of segments and we want that to be available to read from, from the database. Um, we don't care if the, if the load happens quickly I mean, if it takes an hour or even half a day to, to do the load, that's fine. What's important to us is that doing such bulk load doesn't cause a spike in, in, in read latency because then the business side of things would, would stop. Um, all right. Um, is this the same? Oh, sorry about that. Um, there is a best way to, to do bulk loads in Cassandra, which is to, to not do SQL inserts. What is recommended is on the client side to create SS tables. SS tables are Cassandra's internal storage format. So on the client, we take a bunch of rows. Locally, we do, we do pre-turned inserts and we output files that can just be distributed to the nodes. Then the nodes don't have to do the actual single inserts. Um, when we first started doing, doing that with Cassandra, um, using, using batch, batch inserts, we were, we were able to reach a certain level of performance, let's say 10K inserts per second with the cluster we had at the time. Uh, but this had a terrible, very strong impact on read latency for a long time after the, the insertions. Uh, because right after inserting, uh, um, compactions happen and things like that. Um, that was really, really no good. Um, switching to, to doing, to doing um, the conversion from, from rows to SS tables on the client uh, did not allow us to, to insert faster, to insert faster but since it moved some of the load from the, from the cluster to the, to the client, um, it, it allowed us to, to be much nicer to the, to the cluster. So after a bulk insert using um, accessible loader, so accessible loader is a command line tool that comes with Cassandra. You have to write your own code to create the access tables, and then accessible loader, you tell it, I want to insert this into such and such nodes on the cluster, and it takes care of choosing what to send to which, to which node. Uh, so we didn't get better uh, throughput than um, batch inserts, but we, we got a much lower impact on, on read, uh, read latency after the, the insertions. Some impact, but very little. Um, that allowed us to be happy for more than a year. Uh, okay, so there's this little schema. Uh, usually what we get is TSV, but the exact format doesn't matter. Uh, there's a tool that, that I wrote that I called SST loader because I'm very creative in this way, uh, which basically does a few transforms that we need from the input text to what we want to put in the database. Typically we're going to aggregate several segment IDs into one binary record uh, so that we get a, a short blob instead of a long text. 
and it also allows us to save time on the on the client. Uh, if the client doesn't have to to parse text every time, it's it's also a win. Um, so that code is very simple. It basically just hooks into the um, Cassandra jar using the, the methods provided to turn inserts into SS tables, and that's it. Um, all right, the rest are set ready, same throughput, and lower impact on, on latencies. Um, when we switched to, to Scylla, everything worked. So the compatibility promise was there, um, except that strangely, instead of using maybe one node for 20 minutes to create the SS tables and push them, um, we would use like five cores for the same amount of time. So we spoke to, to, uh, to Scylla support and they told us, well, yes, using SS table order is supported, but it doesn't work the same way as in Cassandra. Um, since the, the uh, SS table format has to be the same, the exact same uh, that the database actually uses, uh, the acceptable loader program that comes with Scylla is actually compatibility layer. On the fly, it's going to read the SS tables and convert, convert them to SQL queries to be sent to the, to the nodes. So there's no win in this case in, in using SS table, uh, SS, well, in creating SS tables on the client side, on, on the contrary. Uh, so the best practice is to do single inserts, not batched, uh, because if we want Okay, so if we, if we batch inserts, they are going to be directed to the same node. On that node, if it doesn't, if it's not a node or shard, I'm not entirely clear on the distinction, uh, on that single entity is going to have to dispatch to the, to the others. So non-batched inserts are, are best, or we could batch the, we could batch if client side, we knew uh, which, um, which shard takes which, which key, but so far we haven't had exactly the, the need for, for this. Um, so that's nice. As you can see in that very complex graph, there's one less node than, than before. Um, that means less code to maintain, and the, the performance is, is fine. Uh, it's not really relevant to, to our needs because the bulk go fast enough as, as they do, um, but in, this is, this is early testing for us. We are in the middle of transi transitioning. Uh, the, the throughput has been much higher than we were able to, to achieve on that, on that old Cassandra cluster with uh, twice the, the, the number of nodes. All right. Um, so yeah, the, the most important, important thing for us was the read latency. Um, Using Scylla, we get lower latency, uh, which is nice, but the most important thing for us is we get latency that is much more predictable. So we're going to get 10 milliseconds, or maybe, maybe when load is higher, it's going to climb a little, but we're not going to get those uh, unexplainable spikes of latency that cause us to, to lose business. Um, and then the fact that the, the, the pipeline to do bulk inserts is simpler is just bonus. That, that, that's great. Um, oh yeah, on the last point on the slide, I forgot to mention, uh, SS tables, to create them, you can't just do the equivalent of an insert into table. You have to have, on the client side, uh, some knowledge of the, the schema you're inserting into. Obviously, because since we're creating um, SS tables, so files in the internal storage format, we have to know the exact representation that the database will use. So if, if, I, if I insert something in a text field versus an integer field, the encoding is going to be different. And having to, to export this knowledge of schemas from the cluster to the client, well, it's, it's a bit annoying and we don't need to do that anymore uh, with Scylla. All right, I think that's it.